Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James Grounded Family Bible Study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly, I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Running back to our study of Philemon, verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow labor, to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church in their house. And we left off with fellow last time. And to conclude that, we have Paul was confronted by a fellow soldier, a fellow laborer, and a fellow prisoner. Lastly, fellow laborers, that is all under Jesus Christ to his service, and to his honor, and to his glory. We looked at last time the definition of fellow, a pair, two people working together to the glory of God. There is to be no unemployed Christians, though many do not show up for work. We're all servants as born-again Bible-believing Christians. We are called to dirt duty, and yet many Christians on the field are A-W-O-L, absent without leave. And they're going to get wood, hay, or stubble. So now we pick up the church in his house. And that wasn't too uncommon. Even today. In Norwich, Connecticut, I tried to start a, a church from our home. Now, many Christians out there, let me fix this screen. Many Christians out there, oh, you know, church in their house, the, the great house church. Where do you think it all started from? Do you think when when Jesus was with Mary and Martha, and Martha is cumbering about in the kitchen, and Mary's sitting down at the feet of Jesus, do you think they were in a church building? It's got to start somewhere. And we are in a time here where there were no buildings. So, it is a beginning. Jesus said where there are two or three, and he wasn't talking about bricks, timbers, but people. There are two or three are gathered together in my name. In Acts 2.46, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house. Acts 8.3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house. And Helen, men and women, committed them to prison. Acts 12:12. 12, 12. And when he had considered a thing, he came into the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where they were gathered together praying. So what are you going to do with that? Where we find in the early church in the book of Acts, they met in houses. A church doesn't start off with property in a building. And when you do get a property, and you do get a building, much of your money now has to go for the upkeep of that property and that building that could go for gospel tracts, that go for missionary, can go for other work of the ministry instead of roofs, instead of building extensions, fences, Water bills. Now, if you got a church that's in someone's house, okay, you can help them pay what needs to be in their house. But we got to be careful. See, the Laodicean church age, we've got so scriptural, we're unscriptural. And Acts 12 quoted Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And Paul made havoc, house, churches, 
were a defense from the persecuting government. From even early America, our great early preachers met in fields, paper mills, plantations, tents, and barns. The great awakenings were not in buildings. And when you got someone like Nero running around, you can't put a, oh, the Apostle Baptist Church of Rome. Well, he's going to know where you are. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Underground churches. They don't mean in a building. And it's a building. It's not the same building week to week to week. You go by the Bible and the scriptural sound of the Bible, scripture is scripture. You can say that church buildings are unscriptural. Listen, I know we got a word for rapture, but rapture is a word that describes event in the Bible. I know you can't find Trinity in the Bible, yet, but yet that word describes the Godhead. And when you talk about a church building, you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. only place you find is the temple destroyed by Babylon, rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah, destroyed, built up by Herod, destroyed by the Romans. Next temple is going to be the temple of the Antichrist is going to sit in. The following temple that Jesus Christ will build will remain. But then again, the heavens and earth will fold up, melt, fervent heat. So, and I come to wonder, would Jesus, what would Jesus think of some of, the, of these churches and the buildings today? Especially of the mega church movement. What would God think of thousands, maybe millions, of people sitting in a nice glass church and nothing's going on with the Word of God, nothing's going on with preaching, the Bible is a modern Bible has changed. And yet in the Laodicean church age, it says that Jesus is standing outside at the door knocking. And again, what would Jesus think of some of these church buildings today and the work that's being done inside of them? Read the Laodicean church age. It's not the work of God. We visit a Baptist church in Norwich for a funeral. Trophy cases of awards for sports. Table with the daily bread. And modern Christian magazines, books, and videos of great today preachers. But not a gospel track and not a King James Bible to be found in a Baptist church. In a Baptist church, the daily bread the, the magazine in the Roman Catholic Church. You can find the Daily Bread, but you can't find the King James Bible. And they're not of the King James 69 Bible. And I'm sorry, but that work is the wrong work. It's the work of Satan. And it, yeah, it's a church building. And it holds funerals. It holds weddings. It holds services. It just doesn't hold Jesus Christ. I do remember what Jesus Christ said. But thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. That is the testimony of today's church. And more so for America. Jesus Christ is standing outside the church door. Wanting. To enter. And he's not going to enter into a building and do his work. He wants to enter into man. And do his work. And he's denied. By most. He's denied allowance into the church, into the Bible of the people. So what happens if your church building, for whatever reason, 
burns down. Ashes. Is your church going? Is it done? Is it finished? One must read the two epistles of Timothy about the last days of the church. It's horrible reading, but it's true. Men are going to get worse. When the rapture happens, it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those that remain shall be caught up together. There is no rapture of wood. Or windows. It's the body of believers. And I want to be careful what I say. Because I read an article one time. That, that, that there, there's a Baptist church affiliate. That met in Hooters restaurant. That's wrong. That's sin. That's evil. That's wicked. Outside of a, a sinful, wicked place to me. What's wrong with the early Americans meeting in, in a field, in a factory? What, they were in a church? God couldn't use that? That brought about the Great Awakening. You can't take men and women and children who really love the Lord and have the correct Bible, that want to serve God. You can say that because they're meeting in the living room, they're wrong. Where a man has taken the authority of that gathering to be their pastor and their guidance. Now, I'm not talking about, all right, let's open a Bible and let's shoot around the room what you think is bad. I mean, if somebody has been, has been called by God to preach and teach the Bible. Well, he can only do that in a building? Chapter and verse. If that is not the testimony, then those churches have given that testimony of the church. Their defilement has ruined the name and service of Jesus Christ. When the media uses Christian, who are they addressing? The Roman Catholics. You mean the Christian killers? Well, according to the thing, you can't meet in the living room. The Roman Catholic Church has got the greatest monumental churches and they're dead as a hammer I grew up for at least nine eight nine years in one and when you mention Baptist what do you get you get the preacher and the piano player the hypocrites in the church he only preaches money <clears throat> yeah, most of it is bunk. But what about where the truth does it where is the truth? Does it lie? Christians have forgotten the word testimony. Some of their testimony stinks in the world and in heaven. You got an honest work starting up, and here's one right here in the Bible, it's in their home. And I don't know why you can find it through the book of Acts. I don't know why Christians go against it as wrong. Now, now listen, now you can have an assembly in your living room and be wrong. As you can have an assembly in your living room and be right. I get an email from Brother Lance Smith. I used to get a missionary in China. His emails are encouraging the Christians from the works and the works of AJ Tozer. Last month an email he gives updates. It is it was told after decades of service to God that the Willow Creek Baptist Church is going modern garbage Bibles. Modern garbage ways of service. They're throwing out the hymns, the Bible, and Jesus Christ out the door, Revelation three twenty three. You know, we're getting we're getting now away from you having the church in the living room. Let's look at the church's state in a, in the world today. We have replaced God's word with Satan's word, and all modern Bibles are the Satanic Bible. Anything that removes additions to footnotes, what God has said is is wicked. And when the Bible tells you 
not to correct God's word and you go and do it and then you use that in your pulpits. The hymnals are going out to follow the bouncing ball on the screen. And the old hymns are going out by the modern garbage. The church has grown from old to modern and Jeremiah says, let us seek out the old ways. Home church is the home. Your church is supposed to be more better than your family. In order to be a disciple, Jesus says, you got to hate your mother, your father, your children, your uncles, your aunt. you got to hate your family if they do not love Jesus Christ or else you cannot be a disciple. And many Christians are not disciples because they will not hate those that hate Je that, that love Jesus Christ. And yet our churches are supposed to be that, that Christian love of God as a family. And it's not. You got cliques inside the church. You got people looking their noses down at other people. That's wrong. I mean, I know you you and your needs. That's what the church is. They know who you are. They, they understand who you are. And they can see, hey, wait a minute. At this point in time, there's, there's trouble in your life. We can see it. We know you. We want to help you. And it's not out for hurt. It's out to bless. To be a blessing. What could be more faithful for, for a pastor? That his wife agrees to follow her husband and the ministry. That in the church there are properness. The Bible says a woman is not to assert the authority over the church. And we got churches today with women preachers. The Bible says a woman is to give honor to her husband. She don't honor him at all. She won't take care of his needs. And the man is to be a man. And the man is to guide his house. And the Bible says that, that if the woman has a question, she's to run to her husband, not the pastor. He is to be the spiritual guidance of that family. And many are not. You're lucky if you get men in their families, living with their families today. It's having her to feed and clean the house before services. We are back in the, the church in the living room. That brings a better, more burden upon the wife and to earn more rewards. Before those people come, she's got to clean the house. She's got to make sure the house, everyone's been fed. Because there are people coming over. They're coming over to serve the Lord. You've got to prepare your house for the Lord. As much as your husband has to prepare for the message and the teaching that they're coming to hear. Yeah, that happens in a big church. It's work for both, for the husband and the wife. A sacrifice. A sacrifice of their home, time, and togetherness. They are giving their home for God. What about you? You that despise having church in the living room. They're giving their house. They're giving their time. They're giving their effort. They're giving what they have to God. What are you giving? I guarantee if it's done right in the fellowship of Jesus Christ approved of God, there will be rewards. Again, it can be wrong. It can be done wrong. There are wrong things out there, and there are right things out there. Verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That verse matches Ephesians 1-2. What is the grace from God? It is favor. It is kindness that we don't deserve. 
If we really got what we had coming to us, it would be death and hell. And yet, look what Jesus Christ took for us. Extreme pain. Just the pain alone. How the Bible describes the furrows of his back. The nails in his body. The thorns upon his head. The beard being pulled. And yet the grace of God is that he loves us. That he sent his son to die for us. And that we might not go to hell. And that we, we bicker about where we meet. And there are churches that say, well, we had more vacation Bible students than you had. We got more Sunday school attendance than you had. We got more people that died. Well, shut up. God's looking out for us and caring for us because we are unable. There are things we cannot do. That only God can do. You cannot make yourself breathe. God gives you the ability to breathe. I'm out of work. I can't force myself into a job. I got to rely on God. Health. What can you do for your health? Oh, you got three billion dollars in, in, in the bank. What's that $3 billion going to do if God works against you? What's that $3 billion going to do if the government's working against you? It ain't going to do much. You need that grace of God that you don't deserve it. And yet, His mercy, He gives it to us. It's like a man that has goldfish. They rely on him for their food. Or else they're going to go belly up dead. What if God, with grace, what if God just said, and he's not going to because he's got promises in the word of God, but let, let's just say if God, tomorrow morning, before man wakes up, God says, you know, I just had it with him. I'm sick and tired of him. That's it. I'm just going to let the earth go and I'm going to go do something else. What if Moses did not intercede for the children of Israel in the wilderness? What would have happened? Chaos and death. And what would happen if we did not have the grace of God in our lives? Chaos and death. And there are people out in the world, and however you do a public ministry, their lives are chaos and death, and the grace of God is that he's told us to go all the world and preach the gospel. And God's long-suffering. He has not called us home by the rapture because there are people out there who are lost. I believe today I am living. Today. I have not died. I have not gone home to heaven because I believe Friday night, Lord willing, I got to get tracks out in Daytona. I believe Saturday morning, Lord willing, I got to be there to tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that is my calling of God. And it's not finished. And they don't realize they hate the gospel being preached. But that is the grace and mercy of God by sending someone like me who will do it. And as we're looking at the church that's been foul, it stinks. There are people that God has said go do something and they won't do it. And yet we got churches today that are full of unsaved people. In the event of the rapture, there are churches today that probably won't, not even one person would leave that assembly and they would have no idea until they got in their cars and turned their radios on. Show me the place in the Bible where Satan shows grace. He doesn't. God's the graceful one, while Satan is without grace. There is no mercy out of the devil. 
The devil has no mercy. He has no grace. He doesn't care. Satan rules. He doesn't care. Satan's job right now is to get people to fall down and worship him and to steal the worship of God. As with everybody that does go his way, they will all burn the lake of fire for all eternity and Satan don't care. But the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There is the care. There is the love. There is the mercy. It's not by Satan. It's by God. And the world don't care. You go up to the world. You got a problem. Cash, check, or no cash, no check. Sorry. Can't help you. Save the laws. He's out to destroy God and man's fellowship. He, the Bible says, puts men in darkness. He, the Bible says, that when we go out to try to witness to people, he will swallow down that seed. So man will not hear it. That man will not comprehend what the breath, death, and love of Jesus Christ is. He doesn't care. He was pleased, Satan was pleased when Adam and Eve fell. To which it did hurt God deeply. That moment when God's creation, that they were made, Revelation chapter 4, for the honor and love and to give praise to God. In that moment that they fell. That hurt God. Oh, but Satan was happy. Is that not us? Without God? And what if God removed His grace of sunlight or clouds? What if God removed His grace of rain? We'd be dead. There are areas today in the world there's no rain, it's desert, it's dry, there's no light. Grace that keeps us. <coughs> For what? Our own selfishness? Boy, are we selfish. Boy, do we think of ourselves. Boy, do we lift ourselves up on a pedestal. And yet Paul says, rejoice evermore. Giving thanks. For that is the will of God. We think we earned that 40-hour paycheck. No. For to be fellow laborers and fellow soldiers doing His pleasure. I met them. There are people out there who do the work of the ministry so they will get the praise. They will get the glory. They get the brag. And that's wrong. We are brought, uh, we are bought with a price. We are his. He paid for us. Oh, now we're back to, the, to slavery again. God bought us with his blood. Acts 20, 28. He purchased us and we're men. We are Onassis. Philemon is God. And if we rule out the servant relationship, the slave owner, and then you rule out a great Bible principle. And we need to realize that God who owns us by the blood of Jesus Christ does not ever intend to do harm to us. And though Hebrew says, as a father he may chasten us, that's because he loves us. I've already said in the previous video, yeah, there were rotten slaveholders out there. There are, are, are slaveholders that beaten and bruised and, and killed their slaves. That's Satan. But the man that loves man, that paid the price of men, that we are his servants, is God the Father. We are missing a great illustration. Of who God and Satan really is. God looks out for us. 
This payment was Acts 20:28. 20, and Acts 20:28 20, says God's blood purchased the church. Not bricks, not wood, not stone, but men. God paid his own blood for mankind. And if that doesn't give you goosebumps, you better check your goosebump machine. If that don't put the little hairs up on the back of your neck, you need to get back to Bethel. You need to get back to Calvary. So we are all Onassis. We are called servants and child of God, children of God sons of God and we see illustrations by Jesus he spoke about sons who did serve with you for their fathers the parable son that firstborn boy came in from the fields he must have been working father told his sons go out in the fields and work and you know one son said no I'm not gonna do it and he did, went and did it and the other son said I go do it and he didn't do it It's working for the Father. The epistle of Philemon is the story of our lives. We were lost. And now we're saved. And now we come to God with a letter in our hand. The King James 1611 Bible. God, this letter says that I have believed on Jesus Christ and I am saved. There's no more wrath of God father but there's the love of God I humbly beseech you to tell you that I ran away from you I forsook you I sinned I come back repenting what peace can God give even in the ship and the disciples in a panic the angry waves the mighty winds the almost filled ship and I say almost but Jesus lay to sleep on the pillow. There is peace when all around you is caving in. Troubles and problems. And God sails you through. Oh, when I did this outline. This outline was done 2008. I didn't know what troubles I was going to have in 2010. I didn't know what troubles I was going to have in 2014, 15, 16, 17. And there have been troubles. And there's been the grace of God. And there's been times in my life just recently I've gone to Jesus in that pillow. Wake up, Jesus! The storm is bad! We're sinking! Will you get up? What are you doing sleeping? Grab a bucket! And then Jesus will get up and say, where's your faith, idiot? Peace, be still. And he'll sit at the end of that saying, wow, how great God is. That even though I had my little, my little tin coffee cup, I couldn't bail out the water. But Jesus can calm the storm. It's to God's glory, God's credit. When we get off ourselves, then God can step in. But God can't step into someone who's full of himself. There's no room. Paul is in jail. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And I don't mean the American correction system with cable TV, hot and cold water, hot meals, security guards, rope, clothes, etc. He's in a Roman jail around, <coughs> excuse me, A.D. 64. There are places in the New and Old Testament the description is that of a dungeon. It is most miserable. Paul's not guaranteed to get a meal that day. Paul's not guaranteed to have clean clothes. He do not know 
He does not know who he will be chained to. The Bible says a lot of times he was chained to a to a, 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 a guard. Now don't tell me that they didn't every once in a while try to get the most filthy, deplorable guard they could get. Hey, you're the worst one of our group. We're going to put you with Paul. And yet Paul was able to witness the king. Paul says in one letter, I want you to salute those that are in um, uh, Caesar's household. The word of Paul, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, had gotten to Caesar's household. One must read Tortured for Christ. The rats. The mold. The human waste. The rubber beating tools from America. To understand where Paul is. And he has peace, but not world peace, but God peace. Oh, the, if the conditions in American jail today are, are not good. We can call the, we can call a lawyer, we can call our congressman, and they'll go in there and they'll straighten it out and they'll give you a little bowl for your head and they'll take care of you and they'll give you your own little private cell. That wasn't for Paul. And the men that are in our jails today have no peace because drugs are still slipping in. Alcohol is still slipping in. And they're coming out of the correctional system even worse than what they went in. It shows you our correctional system doesn't work. Because it has no God. Why can we bring a Bible into the prison, but we can't give our children a Bible in the schools? Something wrong with that. America's going down, she's going down quick, and she'll go down quick because she has rejected God and the Bible. For drugs, for music, for alcohol, for comfort, for, oh, don't offend me, for religions. And Paul had God's peace with rats and mold. John 14, 27, peace and I leave with you my peace I give unto you not as the world giveth give I unto you let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid for the world will give you Prozac and Redlin but God gives his peace not from pills or medication I have been in my life in times of trouble bobbing in the water and I've had that peace I've had people say to me several times, why are you taking this so well? Man, if I was in your conditions, I would have failed. I would have flopped. I would have given up. And I look at them like, oh, inside us, that must be the peace of God. And you can be a testimony to someone else. That God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. It is not two beings. It's one. It's like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My mom never gave me a peanut butter sandwich and then a jelly sandwich. They were together. And when you put the two pieces together, that peanut butter and jelly became one. You got peanut butter on this side. And you got jelly on this side. There's God the Father. There's Jesus Christ. And I hope I am not using this illustration of ill effect. And the bread. The Holy Spirit. Though Jesus said on the bread. But when you take that sandwich and you put it together. You have now put the jelly with the peanut butter. The, butter, the, butter, the peanut butter with the jelly. With the bread. And it's one. It's three things. Bread, peanut butter, and jelly. And yet now it's one. That's God our Father. So when we read Jesus Christ died for our sins, it was God and it is God. Acts 20, 28 and John 10, 30. John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. So when we leave verse 3, we're leaving the unity of who Jesus is and the unity of who God is and an unexplainable thing, the Trinity. 
They are three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and yet they're one. And I've heard it explained one times one times one is one. And hopefully maybe when we get the glory and get to heaven one day, hopefully, maybe that's when the God will explain it to us. But we can't have our own prejudice. So we close. And I know some people, oh, the house church. We got more problems than having a, a church in the house. We got Christians who are in churches that are horrible and wicked and terrible. We need to go out there and set churches and pray to God for, for harvesters, for workers in the field, that he may build some churches. That someone who really loves and wants to do right, that there will be a church in their corner, in their neighborhood, around where they live, that does right. Minus the 10,000 that are doing wrong. There's a lot of lighthouses, especially here in Daytona Beach. Almost every single corner, there's a church here. It's impossible. Lighthouses. But somebody unscrewed the bulb. They're just towers. I'm praying to God that maybe he will have me here that build a tower and put a light bulb in it to be a lighthouse. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what God will do as far as the ministry. You may know in your area where you live. You may know there's a lot of churches, but they're not doing nothing. That's a tower. And maybe you need to pray to God and say, God, can you find me faithful enough to build a tower with a light bulb? Because somebody may be in those church towers. They're doing right. They love the Lord. They're doing right. They know they're in a bad situation. But all oh, they're probably praying, saying, Oh, God, can you send somebody so we can group together with believers and not unbelievers? But the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And a lot of them are in those churches because there are no other churches around. Stop condemning someone trying to build a good work using their house. Let's pray that there will be more people like that so more people can find a good, proper, Bible-believing church. Those are needed. Like I told you from Lance Smith, those churches are falling. They are dying. And we're so wrapped up in we're rich, we're, we're great, we're so wonderful, and we're letting churches die. And ought not be so.